sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. You arrested one member of an organized ring of thieves. You're after the head man of the gang. Your job, get him. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers. And important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 24th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were at the main jail, and it was 8.14 a.m. when we got to the second floor, the interview room. Sit down, Sloan. Yeah. Right there. You guys start pretty early in the morning, don't you? Yeah, once in a while. You got a cigarette? Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I never feel like I'm alive until I've had a cigarette in the morning. How about a match? Here. There's nothing like it, that first cigarette. All right, what's this all about? You know that as well as we do. A few questions we want to ask. All right, go ahead and ask. What's your part in the setup? I don't know what you're talking about. No, it won't work, Sloan. We got the whole story from Summers. Well, then what do you need from me? Just like to check out a few things. What do you mean you got the whole story from Summers? What did he say? He told us everything he knows about the setup. From what he says, you're the key man. Everything goes through you. He said that? Yeah. You believe him? Got no reason not to. That's why we're here. Get your side of the story. How much he tell you? He said everything he knows. Yeah. Yeah, that figures. You get a guy with a yen like that, and as soon as the roof starts to drop, they spill their insides out. That's the trouble with doing business with hypes. You always run into it. Yeah, well, let's hear your side, huh? Sure. I knew going in, if you locked Summers up, he'd break. Just a matter of time before he started seeing things and talked all over the place. Why don't you do a little of the same? I got no choice. Where do you want me to start? How about the beginning? Yeah, it's as good a place as any, I guess. All right, who's the big gun in the setup? Now, you're not going to believe well, this. Why don't you try us? I don't know who he is. I haven't got the slightest idea, and that's the truth. You're asking us to buy the fact you work for a guy you don't know. I don't care if you buy it or not. That's the way it is. I don't know who the big man is. How'd he get your orders? He calls me. Where? My place. When? When I got something for him. How does he know? We got a set time each day he calls in. He tells me what he wants done. I tell him what's going on. What happens if you want to talk to him and it's not the time? Huh? Nothing. I got to wait. How do you get paid? He calls me and tells me where to go. I show up there and the dough's wait. All right, now you start at the beginning. Give us the whole story. All right, I got in town about six months ago. Where from? Outside of Chicago. All right. I laid around town for a few days, and I get this rumble that maybe I can pick up a job. Where'd you hear it? Oh, just around. I couldn't tell you where it was, a word here, another one there, just around. All right, go ahead. Well, I'm home one day, and the phone rings. I answer it, and the guy asked me if I wanted to go to work for him. I'm on my upper, so I asked him what he wanted me to do, and he springs this car heist thing on me. I told him I wanted no part of it. Yeah. He kept on talking, kept telling me how it was such a sweet, clean racket, how we could work it without being tagged. Finally, I told him I might be willing to sit down and talk to him about it. Mm -hmm. He says no go. Said he didn't want anybody to know who he was, and that went for me, too. He told me he'd swing the operation off. What do you mean, swing it? Well, he said he'd tell me how to set it up, how to make it work, who to contact. Said he had the organization already, but he needed a man to take charge of the L.A. part of it. He told me that I was the guy he wanted. Well, Sloan, how did he happen to come to you? I don't know. I did time when I was a kid for Grand Theft Auto. First time, I got off light. Where'd you do the time? New York State. All right, go on. Well, maybe you got a rumble about that. 
He knew that I was down. Maybe he figured that I was the guy to handle it for him. I don't know why. He just called. Do you have any idea who this man on the phone was? No. I thought about it a lot. I tried to come up with an answer, but there just wasn't any. At least none that I could find. Might have been somebody you met back east. I don't know. Could be. I got no way of knowing. The way the deal worked out, I didn't have any reason to get nosy. This guy really had it figured out like a charm. I still don't know how you tagged us. How about it? You tell me. You know better, man. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. All right, go ahead. What happened after you talked to this guy? Well, I wasn't real anxious right off. I told him I'd have to think about it, you see. Yeah. Next day, he calls again. Told me he wanted to tell me the deal. Lay it out for me. If I thought it was good, I could go along with it. Otherwise, we could call it quits. I was just about to get bounced out of my room, so I listened. We must have talked for about an hour. Yeah. That's when he laid it out for me. The way it looked, the plan couldn't miss. It wasn't anything he hadn't thought of all along the line. He had the leaks all plugged up tight, you see. All right. How'd this deal work? I thought Summers gave you the lineup. Yeah, he it. did, but we'd like to hear it from you, you all sure right? you sure you ain't trying to con me into something? You said it yourself. You got no choice now, have you? Uh, well, the way it worked was smooth, real smooth. The boss, that's what I called him, he'd call me, tell me what kind of car he wanted. I'd get in touch with one of the boys and pass the order on, you see? Yeah. Hype would steal the car, call me. Who? Some hype would steal the car and call me right away, tell me where he had the car. Then the boss would call and I'd tell him. He'd drive by, look at the car. If he okayed it, he'd call me and I'd tell the fellow that stole it to get it rolling. They'd drive it to Mexico, huh? Yeah. First off, I'd meet him and give him enough money to get back here, though. And after that, they'd switch the plates in the car and then shove out. Where'd you get the plates? Oh, the boss would get them someplace. Then they'd be delivered to me. Always cold plates. I, I think he probably got them off a used car lots. I don't know, but that's the way it looked like to me. You see? Yeah. What happened then? Well, the guy would drive the car straight through. He'd deliver the car to a contact down at Tijuana. What about the payoff from Mexico? How'd they work that? Well, that went through me, too. I'd get a call from the boss. He'd tell me where the meat was. I'd show up and pick up a paper bag with the narcotics. Is that the way the stolen cars were paid for? Narcotics? Yeah. Heroin was the best, so by the time we cut it down, it went a long way. What'd you do with the stuff? Well, some of it I'd use for paying off the hype that lifted the car, and the rest went on to the boss. How'd you get it to him? He'd call me, tell me where to leave it. Maybe an alley downtown, a telephone pole on Central. Once in a fountain right in front of City Hall. Every time, though, it's a different place. Yeah. Is it possible any of the others might know who he is? Ah, I talked to him. None of them know. I don't think they're holding on. Yeah. This boss, he ever say anything that could let you know where he was calling from? No. How about his voice? You get anything from that? What do you mean? He have an accent, something like that? No, nothing. He talked just like you and me. There's one thing, though. What's that? He's been around. He knows the tricks. He knows about me, everything I've ever done. The way he talks, you know he knows all the rackets. Mm-hmm. He ever sent you anything through the mail? No, what do you mean, like with a postman? That's right. No. A couple of times he sent me a batch of plates to use on the cars, but they come by messenger. One of the companies here? No, just a guy. I asked them who sent them, but they couldn't tell me. Couldn't or wouldn't? I ain't sure, but I really don't think they knew. It's always a different guy each time. Never the same one twice. You got some of the plates around? No, we used the last one on the car last night. When does the boss usually send them to you? Depends on how many cars we've taken. He keeps track. When we're out of cold plates, another batch of them shows up. It depends on the cars, you think. How about the other men working with you? The ones here in town? You give us a list of them? If I do, it makes me a pretty big think. You don't, it's going to make you big trouble. I suppose so. There's nothing you guys can promise me for this, huh? You know the answer to that, too. We can see that the district attorney's office knows about the help he gave us. That's all we can do. It's better than nothing. Okay, I'll give you the names. Now, when this goes to trial, we can figure you'll be a witness for the state. Against who? Well, this boss, whoever he is. Sure, if you can get him, I don't think you will, though. Is that right? Sure, it stands to reason. I worked for the guy and never got to see him. He ain't going to want to see the police. Well, he's a little like you, isn't he? Huh? He's got no choice. We got the list of names from the suspect, and then we checked with Captain Carl Shy, Narcotics Division. He assigned two men to work with us on the case. We got in touch with the Sheriff's Department and filled Sergeant Judge Shelton in on the development. A call was put into Al Gaten at San Diego, and he said that he'd get in touch with the Mexican authorities and line up the cooperation we needed from them. The name of the contact in Tijuana was given to them, but they were unable to locate the suspect. We asked the stats office to make a new run on the M.O. of the auto thefts in an attempt to come up with a new lead on the head of the ring of thieves. They turned up six leads that were checked out. They netted us nothing. We got in touch with the state highway patrol, and we worked out a system to intercept any cars that might be stolen in the future by the same gang. The plan was that in the event we received a call regarding a stolen vehicle, we'd put it on the air with the heading of the code word Alex. This would alert all police officers between Los Angeles and the Mexican border. The men named for us by the suspect Harry Sloan were all taken into custody. Further interrogation netted us no new information. In the meantime, the leader of the gang had apparently succeeded in setting up a new group of thieves and was operating again. The thefts continued through the next month. During that time, all precautions were taken to keep the stolen cars from getting to the border, but the speed with which the gang operated made apprehending them almost impossible. The radio operation with patrol units along the highway was tried, but by the time the cars were reported stolen to us and we were able to get a broadcast out on them, they were already across the border. 
Thursday, July 30th. Frank and I checked into the office. I'll check the book. Right. Anything? No, I'll call here from Fay, that's all. Well, Skipper sure hacked about this thing, huh? Can you blame him? No, I suppose not. He's got a lot of people leaning on him. I don't know, Joe. It's about time the brakes start falling on our side. Well, we've been saying that for a long time, too. It doesn't seem to do much good. Even when we do nail the big gun, we're going to have to prove it, and that isn't going to be easy. Yeah. The way he's got it worked out, it's going to be awful tough to build a case that'll stick. Well, he doesn't handle the narcotics. He doesn't handle the money. All he does is okay the jobs. Yeah, but there's got to be an outlet for the heroin. Well, where's he getting rid of it? That's a good question. You know, we've been trying to come up with the answer a long time. No rumbles, informants don't know anything. I get it. Auto theft Friday. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe we can help you. Yes, ma'am, huh? Well, yes. Well, could we meet you? Oh, no, ma'am. You won't be involved. Yo, oh, what's that address again? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. We'll be there. Oh, in about ten minutes? Uh, what's that? No, ma'am. Just my partner. Yes, that's right. All right. See you then. Right. Goodbye. Well, maybe this is a break. Who was it? Woman. She wouldn't give us her name. She said that wasn't important. She wants us to meet her. What about? Something to do with used cars. Ten ten a.m. Frank and I left the office and drove to Hollywood to meet the woman who'd called in. She said that she wanted to meet us in one of the coffee shops along Vine Street. We drove out the new freeway to Hollywood Boulevard and then down to Vine Street. We parked the car and walked up to the coffee shop. The girl on the phone had refused to give us her name, so Frank and I had no way of knowing who she might be. She told me to take a booth at the back of the restaurant and that she'd find us. Frank and I sat down and ordered a cup of coffee and we waited. There was no sign of the caller. 11 a.m. She still hadn't shown up. We were about ready to leave when a tall woman, well-dressed, in her middle 30s came in. She stopped at the door, looked around the place, and then she headed for our booth. Joe. That yeah, might be. No, she's heading for the next booth. Are you from the police? What? Are you a policeman? No, why? Never mind. Are you from the cops? Yes, ma'am. I'm the one who called you and told you to meet me here. Yes, ma'am. I'm Joe Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. You got some way to prove it? Ma'am? Prove that you're cops. I don't want to talk to nobody who ain't a cop. Yes, ma'am. Here's my ID card. Oh, yeah. That's you, all right. Yes, ma'am. How about you? Yes, ma'am. Here's mine. Oh, yeah. Oh, say, that's a real nice picture. You put on some weight, haven't you? Would you like to sit down, ma'am? We can get started on this. Oh, yeah, sure. Now, what was your name? Well, you don't need that. It doesn't make any difference. All right. We order you something, maybe? Yeah, I'd like a Coke. All right. I'll get it, Joe. You make sure it's a real Coke, though. Genuine. All right, ma'am. I'm sorry I'm late. I got tied up. That's all right, ma'am. I wonder if we can get started. Well, I was across the street waiting by the radio station. Yes, ma'am. Uh, waiting for that singer. Uh, oh, what's his name? You know who I mean. The cute one with the curly hair. Oh, I never can think of his name. Anyway, I was waiting for him to come out. He's doing a show over there, you know. He's a wonderful voice, and he's so cute. Uh-huh. Now, what's this all about, this thing you want to tell us? Crazy kids in their autograph books. I couldn't even get near him. Miserable. I wonder if we could get out of business here, ma'am. You said on the phone that you could give us some information? Yeah, I think I can help you out. It seems to me that you might want to talk to this man. What's his name? Well, maybe I ought to tell you about him first, and then if you want to know his name, I can tell you that. All right, ma'am. Go ahead. Here's a Coke, ma'am. Oh, thanks. Mmm, right, that's good. It's cold. Do you want to go on? On? Yes, ma'am, about the man. Oh, yeah. Well, there's this fellow, and he's got an office in the building where I work. Where would that be? A corner of Hollywood and Dick Street. Right on the corner. Ninth floor. Elevator's always out of order. Yes, ma'am. Well, he's got this office, and I see him a lot. You know, at the elevator? Maybe down at the magazine rack in the lobby. Anyway, I see him a lot. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, about a week ago, he asked me for a date. Just like that. Come up to me while I was looking at TV stars parade. At the magazine. Uh Uh-huh. All about television stars, where they work, what they're like. All interesting things like that, like do they like garlic and what kind of knot do they use in their ties. All interesting things like that. So this man asked you for a date, huh? Came up just like brass and asked me out. Well, first off, I was kind of flattered. You know, he's pretty nice. Drives a nice car and all, but I told him I couldn't go out with him. And then I told him that I thought he should be ashamed of himself. I told him he should be ashamed of himself. Yes, ma'am. Sure. See, I knew he was married. Nice little wife. Real cute. I saw her a couple of times around the building. Lately, she hasn't been too well. He's real cute. Imagine him asking me out and him a married man. Well, yes, ma'am, but why do you think that the police might be interested in him? 
I'm coming to that. Oh. Mm, that was good. Well, I kind of checked around, you know, to see what this guy did and what business he was in. Yes, ma'am. He's in the used car business, sells old cars. I see. That's it. Sells used cars in an office building. Not even a lot. Nothing. There's a glass door. Is there any lettering on it? Yeah, I thought about that, too, but there isn't. No, that's all he's got, just this little tiny office, desk, and a couple of chairs. Glass door. Well, ma'am, there's nothing illegal in that, you know. Oh, yeah, but he doesn't have a license. No, sir, he doesn't have a license. Beg pardon? I work for a lawyer. Alphabetical filing, G to O. I asked my boss if you didn't have to have some kind of license to sell cars, and my boss says you do. This man doesn't have one. He goes out and buys these old cars and then fixes them up and sells them, and he doesn't have a license. Well, not only that, the man he sells the cars to. Oh. Why do you say that? Well, because I do, that's why. I always come in the office, and they sit there and talk and talk, and then they leave. I've been in the hall sometimes, and they laugh, and they're real spooky guys, real spooky. Well, what's the matter, man? Man that just came in. The one with the kind of blonde hair, you see him? Yes, ma'am. What about him? Isn't that... Oh, what's his name? I know it as well as I know my own. He stars in all those space things, you know, like the Saturn Saga and the Martian Maniac that was on last week, and this fellow, that one that just came in. Well, he had on this kind of suit, all covered with lights, a space suit. He was so cute. Yes, ma'am. Well, if you'll tell us the name of the man in your building, we'll check on him. Oh, there's more to the story. Ma'am? There's more. I'm not finished. All right, would you like to sit down and go on? Oh, yeah. Well, the day before yesterday, I'm standing by the elevator, and one of this man's customers come out of the office. He walks over to the elevator. Mm-hmm. He reached into his pocket and took out a cigarette, kept the pack up here in the pocket up here. You know, here, with the handkerchief. Yes, ma'am. Well, when he pulled the pack out, he dropped a little package. So right on the floor, and he didn't see it. Right away, he got into the elevator and went down, and I went over and picked it up, a little tiny thing. Got it right here in my purse. I was going to give it to the man, and... Then I thought maybe I better come to you. I saw a picture of a thing like this in the newspaper once. Here it is. Well, you just look at that. There, you see? Yes, ma'am. What is it, Joe? Harold. Eleven forty AM. We continued to talk to the woman. She gave us the name of the man who ran the used car agency in her building, Ralph Holland. She also gave us a description of him and a description of the man she'd seen drop the narcotics. We went back to the office and checked the name through R&I. Holland had a record listing one arrest on suspicion of violation of the State Narcotic Act. The date of the arrest was August 17, 1937. He'd been released for lack of evidence. We checked the name in the phone book and came up with a business and a residence address. He lived with his wife in a large tract out in the San Fernando Valley. 1.15 p.m. Frank and I drove out to talk with Holland's neighbors. They told us that the family was known and respected throughout the area. None of them could recount any actions that might cause suspicion. They told us the Hollands had lived in the house for the past five years, but that Mrs. Holland had said that the family was planning to move into town. From the neighbors, we found out that Mrs. Holland was a semi-invalid and rarely left the house. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on the house, and then we drove back into Hollywood to talk with Holland's business associate. From them, we got the same story. Ralph Holland was a respected member of the community and was a member of several civic clubs. None of his friends could tell us much about his business activities. We did learn, however, that many of his friends couldn't figure how the family could live at the scale that they did. They said that Holland had a good business, but they couldn't see how he could afford the new cars that he drove or the new house he was planning to move into. By 46 p.m., we checked back into the office and talked with Captain Nelson. Well, it should take us a couple of days to get the information back from the banks. Yeah. In the meantime, we've got a lot of walking to do. Yeah. It's going to be tough. Well, Skipper said we could have all the help we needed. You got in touch with narcotics? Yeah, I called him this morning. They'll give us a hand. Yeah, rough duty, isn't it? What do you mean? Well, we figured the guy's guilty, looks good for it. Now the big job. Yeah. Got to prove it. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. 
Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today. Regular or king size. Friday, July 31st, the legwork started. Two teams of men were assigned from auto theft detail to help us, and narcotics sent two more teams to work with us. For the next three weeks, Ralph Holland was kept under 24-hour surveillance. A stakeout was maintained on his house and on his office. His business records were checked. From these, we came up with an estimate of what the suspect's income was. Then we began to check his expenditures. As a result, we found that he had control of at least $250,000 that his business could not account for. Everyone who visited the Hollands, either at their home or at his office, was checked on. Among his visitors, we found several known narcotic dealers. The auto thefts continued, but by now the code system had begun to work. From July 31st to August 25th, 16 cars were stolen that we attributed to Holland's operation. All of them were recovered between Los Angeles and the Mexican border. All of the drivers of the cars were taken into custody, but none of them could give us any information to aid us in obtaining a conviction. During that time, Holland didn't make any attempt to handle any narcotics. A dictograph had been placed in his office, and all of his conversations were monitored, but nothing incriminating was said. We got the address of the new home the suspect had bought, and a complete set of listening equipment was installed there. From the time the couple moved into the house, their conversations were monitored 24 hours a day. The recordings were played for Captain Nelson, Captain Shy of Narcotics Division, and for the men from the district attorney's office. They agreed that there wasn't enough evidence to issue an indictment. Friday, August 28th, Frank and I checked into the listening post. Well, you might as well sit down, Frank. We got a long night. It's gonna be better with a speaker. What? The fellow's downtown putting a speaker, see? Earphones get too heavy. Oh, yeah. I was talking to Guy Anderson. He was out here. He said by the time you sit with those things on your head for a couple of hours, feels like somebody shot your ears full of Nova game. Yeah. The speaker's better. Yeah, I imagine so. Easier, too. Yeah. Well, better turn it on, huh? Yeah. Holland, come home yet? Just walked in before we got here. Oh, here they come. Hey, Yeah. How about a drink? Sounds like they're in the living room, huh? Yeah. You want to take a trip with me? Where to? Oh, well, man, we drive down south. You know, I figured I'd go to Mexico. Oh, I got it, honey. And anybody else to send? Things been rough lately. Been picking the boys up as fast as I can find them. Why did you call it quits? You've made enough. Just about to do that, honey. That's the last trip. Oh, I'm glad of that. Honey, I don't like it. Maybe I'm just getting jittery, but I swear there have been men watching the house. Here. Thank you, Jim. Division were parked down the street from the Holland home. At 8.36 a.m., we saw the couple come out of the house and get into Ralph Holland's car. They drove out to Sepulveda Boulevard and they turned south. All units of the state police had been notified to watch for the car. Members of the sheriff's department were stationed along the road just outside Del Mar. If we could take Holland into custody while he was in the possession of a stolen car and confront him with the stories of the two suspects we picked up earlier, George Summers and Harry Sloan, we felt that there was a good chance that he might confess. In any event, we'd be able to bring him to trial on a grand theft auto charge. The meet was made with the man who'd stolen the car as scheduled, and Holland started to drive south to the border. Men from the sheriff's department took the thief into custody, and we followed Holland. About four minutes later, he pulled the car over to the side of the road in front of a small coffee stand. He and his wife got out of the car, and they went into the place. We drove by, and then we doubled back and parked about 100 yards up the road from the stand. All right, let's go. The boy should be around back by now. Yeah. All right, come on. Yeah. You Ralph Holland? 
Yes, what do you want? You driving that green Buick out there? Yeah, so what? I wonder if we can see the registration papers on the car. What for? Police officers. We'd like to see the registration papers. <laughs> You got no right to hit him like that. We weren't doing anything. You got no right. right come on, Holland. Funny for you. Yes, you Play a little rough, don't you? We didn't call it. You did. All right, hands are back here. Stand still. How about it? He's clean. You guys sure got a lot of nerve to come in here and beat him up like this. Who tipped you? Who finked out? Well, don't worry about it. Somebody had to, but there wasn't anybody that knew. Nobody at all. How'd you find out? All right, come on. It's perfect. All the way around. Where'd I go sour? When'd I make the mistake? When you started. <laughs> just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Next time you buy cigarettes, I wish you'd kind of keep us in mind and remember what we've told you about Chesterfield. First, with premium quality, highest quality, in both regular and king size. You smoke a couple of packs and you'll see what I mean. Chesterfields are milder with a wonderful taste. And you want to remember this. Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. See for yourself, won't you? Ralph P. Holland was tried and convicted on 12 counts grand theft auto. His wife, Mildred R. Holland, was tried and convicted of one count grand theft auto. Seven other members of the gang were apprehended and brought to trial on the same charges. They all received sentences as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one or more than ten years. Four suspects were apprehended and tried on charges of violation of the State Narcotic Act of felony. They were convicted and received terms as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotic Act of felony is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one nor more than six years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Stacy Harris, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima. See how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. 